Welcome back, Warriors. Kwe Tansei Sego Anibuju. Kwe Nin Deluizi Pam Palmeter, and I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. This podcast is a show about living the warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits, while at the same time revitalizing our cultures, traditions, laws, and governing practices. And it's also about asserting, living, and defending our sovereignty all over Turtle Island. And one of the most important things that we can do as nations is protect the health, safety, and well being of our children. And I, for one, feel so grateful to know that there are people like Dr. Cindy Blackstock and her incredible team at the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society who make protecting First Nations their number one priority. And what I really appreciate about their advocacy work is that they bring the kids along with them. They're involved in what they do, they're the number one focus, and they make accessible resources for those who want to help. Most of all, and probably most impactfully, is that they are 100% transparent. That means all of their advocacy work, their research, all of their legal submissions are all posted on their website for anyone and everyone to access. And this isn't by mistake. Cindy and her team are intentionally transparent so that we can all be witnesses to what Canada is or isn't doing to end racial discrimination against First Nations children in care and their families. And today, we are so lucky to have Dr. Cindy Blackstock here to help us understand the recent report issued by the Parliamentary Budget Officer uh, about comp the compensation order from the tribunal uh, that was issued against Canada and is meant to compensate First Nations children. And if you don't know the background of the tribunal case, what now would be really a great time Put this on pause, go and listen to some of our past videos, our past podcasts, because Cindy's been joined the Warrior Life podcast several times. We've had lengthy conversations with lots of really detailed information. So check that out and I'll post all the links in the description box so that you can access them. But for today, and for those of you who just potentially might not know her, Dr. Cindy Blackstock is a member of the Gitsan First Nation in BC. She's had more than 25 years of social work experience in child protection and Indigenous children's rights. And she's won numerous awards and honorary doctors. I could literally sit here and call her Dr. 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 Cindy for days. But she focuses on identifying and more importantly, remediating structural inequalities affecting First Nations, children, youth, and families. Thank you so much for joining us again on the Warrior Life podcast, Cindy. I'm so excited to be here, Pam. You know, I always enjoy our conversations. Yeah, me too. And I just love how you have a little spirit bear pin yeah. there. Check that out. Like this was beaded uh, by an artist, a First Nations artist in, in, in BC. And my sister got him for me for, for Christmas. And so now I'm wearing Spirit Bear wherever I go. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, you're always representing. Um, maybe just quickly before we get started, you could tell us a little bit about yourself and the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, just for people who don't know what that organization is. Sure. So I grew up in the bush in northern BC. My first job was picking pine cones back in the day when there was uh, forest ranger stations, remember, and lookout towers. That's how old I am. And uh, then I finally um, got into doing some social work at the front lines. And what I saw there is that the children and families that were at risk, it was because of the underfunding of the government and the trauma on the, they were experiencing because of residential schools in the 60s scoop. And I thought child welfare was holding them responsible for things that they really couldn't change at a personal level, at least not alone, not without services. So that's where I really got into kind of uh, working with others across the country at addressing those inequalities in public services for First Nations children on reserve. And so I've been doing that now for about 25 years. And the Caring Society, where I'm totally honored to be a team member, along with the great people here at the Caring Society, um, its real job is to work with communities to make sure that First Nations children 
can have a fair chance to grow up safely in their families, get a good education, be healthy and proud of who they are. And we do that. Um, unfortunately, we've had to turn to litigation against Canada to achieve that equity in children's services. We're not there yet, but we've come a long way. And then we also have all kinds of information, resources for community members, for others, members of the public to learn about First Nations children and families. And then the final thing we do is we engage children of all diversities and being real allies to address the contemporary inequalities for First Nations kids so that we're able to co-create a Canada where First Nations kids don't have to recover from their childhoods anymore. So that's pretty much what we do. And it, that's no small undertaking, you know, to try to protect children from having to, you know, survive and heal the trauma of their childhoods. Now, some of the people who are listening um, are regular listeners, so they've heard your past podcasts and they know all the detailed history, but some might just be joining us for the first time today because they've heard about this parliamentary report and want to know what's you know happening but I think before we start talking about that maybe you could give us like a little bit of detail on what is the case the decision that came out of the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal and what does it mean? Well a lot of people uh, may not be aware that the Canadian government funds First Nations services on reserve all the public services uh, whereas the provinces and territories do so for everyone else and Back 113 years, they knew they were underfunding these critical services, and that was resulting in the deaths of children. And we see these reports year after year, decade after decade, different types of people coming together. Sometimes it was first, often First Nations, but they were joined by different experts. And Canada would acknowledge the report and do nothing about it, or do very little about it. And the inequalities piled up. So in 2007, the Assembly of First Nations and the Caring Society filed a complaint against the federal government saying their failure to rectify these inequalities despite knowing about the harms it was creating to children and particularly the unnecessary family separations because these families weren't giving a fair shake in terms of having resources available to be able to safely care for their children at home. And then the other piece was that Canada was not implementing Jordan's principle properly to ensure that First Nations kids could access public services free of discrimination because they were First Nations. In fact, I'm looking at the calendar right now, uh, Pam, and in three days will mark the 14th anniversary since we filed that case. 14 years. 14 years. Yeah. I look at pictures of myself and I can tell 14 years has gone by <laughs> and not in a good way. But um, all to say that for up until 2016, we were fighting Canada on this. They were fighting it on, on technical things that had nothing to do with children. They just didn't want the evidence before the Canadian public. Thankfully, they lost on all those procedures. Um, and by 2014, 13, we finally got to trial. 2016, the tribunal finds that Canada is racially discriminating against these children in ways that are causing unnecessary family separations, kind of like just like the same way we were seeing at the U.S. border, where those children are being separated. Well, this is happening again on a third leg after residential schools in the 60s group. Now it's continuing and Canada is through its funding processes, making sure that First Nations kids couldn't grow up in their homes. And that was discriminatory. Uh, Canada came out and welcomed the decision, and they didn't implement it. So I think I lose track sometimes, but I think we're at 10 non-compliance orders so far, and the litigation is still continuing. It seems incredulous, you know, to be in a country which has, you know, purportedly said there's no relationship more important than the one with Indigenous peoples. And, you know, we're going to go forward in a renewed nation-to-nation -nation relationship. And that relationship is going to be based on respect for your rights. Presumably, human rights would be the foundation of that relationship. Yet, you know, to hear that there's 10 non-compliance orders, I mean, and then... And then now we're at this situation where there is an order for compensation. And I'm wondering if you just tell us a little bit about that. Like, who is who is intended to be compensated and for what? Right. So under the Canadian Human Rights Act, you can get $20,000 for being just experiencing discrimination and up to $20,000 if it was willful and reckless, which basically means... Um, did the group that was discriminating against you know about they were doing harm to you and could have they prevented it? And the answer uh, to this 
is yes in terms of Canada. They knew they were discriminating. They knew they were harming kids. Uh, they continued to do it anyway. So the tribunal ordered $40,000 per victim of discrimination. And when I talk about victims of discrimination, I'm talking about children who are removed from their families. Sometimes their parents were actually in residential schools for which the government had apologized, or they were 60 scoop survivors for which the government apologized after residential schools. And these kids grew up in foster care when they could have grown up at home had their families received support. The other group of kids are the, Jordan, uh, the kids who are denied services under Jordan's principle. And in some of these cases, we actually tragically know of cases where the denial of services contributed to the deaths of children. So some of these children are no longer with us because of Canada's discrimination. And in other cases, that denial of services that otherwise other kids would get, that created lifelong harms for those children. And so we're talking about thousands and thousands of people who have experienced these horrible harms to them as children because Canada continued the discrimination for so long. And even after we filed the complaint, you'd think that if, if it was you or I, Pam, and we had a complaint filed against us that we're discriminating against children, we think, oh my God, what? let's look into this. We don't want this to happen. But no, Canada continued to procedurally fight it. And so the number of children and families during the long history of this, this litigation, and then with the non-compliance, meant the number of victims piled up. Again, another situation which didn't have to be. First of all, I mean, they, they couldn't, with good faith, pretend that they didn't know that there was a problem with the overrepresentation of First Nations children in foster care and all of the harms that they were suffering from the denial of services, like Jordan River Anderson, for example. But even if they did pretend that, you know, once the decision is there saying you're racially discriminating, that, you know, that is counter to human rights, you, you must stop this to not stop that, to instead focus on trying to fight you procedurally over and over and over and over again while adding numbers. And sometimes people, you don't get a true sense of the picture when we're talking about just statistics, you know? Yeah. So it's like, oh, this number and that number. But you talk about a different kind of statistics from the perspective of the individual child. And I'm wondering if you can talk about like, the harms that individual children suffer in addition to being away from their families. Like you talk about it in terms of nights, like sleeps, the number of sleeps they're away from their family or their community. Right. So um, one of the things I just want to say is at the time we filed the complaint on the government's own website, it, it acknowledged that they were underfunding child welfare, First Nations child welfare so badly that they were driving more kids into care. So that was right on their government website. And then when we got the evidence of the documents finally, I was the one who had to testify on the stand, Pam, to enter those documents. And I literally just felt sick reading it. It was so heartbreaking. And, and, what, and what was even made it more heartbreaking is to see how banal the write-up would be about these children in the federal documents. So you're talking about the number of sleeps First Nations children enter into care. We use words like overrepresentation a lot. And it's so easy to say, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason it's easy to say is because it's not the way that children would think about it. It's not the way that children that we love in our circles would think about it. The way that children in our circles think about something is how many sleeps until I see my mom? Hmm. Or how many sleeps until I see my sister or brother or uncle or dad? That's the way they think about things when they're in a situation that's hard for them, when they're away from the people that love them. And in this document was an Excel spreadsheet. So just imagine an Excel spreadsheet and it counted up the number of nights that First Nations children, this is on reserve only, and in the Yukon spent in foster care between 1989 and 2017. And it was over 78 million nights. 
78 million. That's over 167,000 years of childhood, right? And we saw, and during that time, and Pam, you'll remember, we were seeing even on the news, the stories of what that looked like. I always think of Tina Fontaine, right? Uh, there we had a beautiful young girl who grew up in a community that was denied the basic services she ought to have received. And then she moved off reserve, was in foster care, and she ends up being murdered on the, the banks of the river in Winnipeg, the Red River. And the person who uh, did that was never held accountable. But she is a child that's no longer here, who we don't, we think that her outcome would have been very different if she would have been treated with the respect and honor when she was a little girl and her family given the supports. And, and for those of you out there who are thinking, well, you know, these kids are in care for a reason. Well, you're, you're right in one sense that they're, they're in care for a reason. But what's wrong about that picture is that First Nations children are overrepresented in child welfare, not due to abuse, although that happens and that's unacceptable. They're overrepresented because families are growing up in poverty, poor housing, substance misuse related to the trauma of residential schools in the 60s scoop. And these inequitable services, not having the same resources that everybody else has versus a whole heap load of trauma from colonialism. So if we were to really address these inequalities, they go a long way to supporting families to keeping these kids safe in their family homes. The other the cases I think about are the Jordan's principal cases. And um, this, this is very personal for me because Jordan was a real little boy. And I think this is a people sometimes forget, right? I have had the privilege of meeting his family and I actually, on, on, I have his baby blanket that uh, mm -hmm. at, it has little bears on it that was gifted by the family. He was a real little boy and he died in hospital after waiting two and a half years for governments to fund services that would have been available to any other child, but they just wouldn't do it, they were arguing. And then Jordan's principles birthed out of his memory by his family. It's a gift to all of us to make sure First Nations children would get the access they need to services when they need them. And then what Canada did to the, his memory, now think about this, this is a sacred gift from his family. What they did is took this gift of Jordan and they created it into something that was discriminatory. They took an approach that was so narrow, no child ever qualified. And they had nowhere that families could access Jordan's principal. And yet what we found when we got to trial and they finally had to show us the documents that the Department of Indian Affairs had is we saw cases that actually did come to their attention. And again, these documents were just heartbreaking. Like I, there's another Excel spreadsheet and it includes children who needed things like urgent in insulin pumps, uh, feeding tubes, um, basic, uh, mental health support. And then there's a column on the right hand side that says basically whether the case was resolved or not. And they would include children who died. That was a resolved case. Or children who had waited so long they were no longer children. That was a resolved case. And in some very few cases, they were able to patch together something with a private donor or something to meet that child's needs. And there were also cases like the one that just I can't can't even get her out of my mind is a little four year old little girl, right? We can all think about four year olds, right? How beautiful they are. There's a year before kindergarten, and she goes in for some just basic dental surgery, and something goes horribly wrong. And it's in the Christmas season of around 2011 and 12, and she um, ends up. Uh, with severe brain damage. And she needs a hospital bed to keep her at an incline when she goes home so she doesn't suffocate prematurely. And that request goes through 15 different people in the Federal Department of Indian Affairs before someone writes in there, absolutely not. And they're doing this stuff in the public interest. I don't know what they, like I'm a taxpayer. That's exactly what I want my taxes to be used for. Yeah. 
four-year-old little kids versus all this other nonsense that governments do. But that was the, the idea. And then Michael Wernick, you'll remember him, Pam. He uh, was the deputy minister of Indian Affairs during the whole time we're pretty much the whole time we were litigating this case. He actually awarded the public servants who said no to that little four-year-old little girl under Jordan's principal and all others, the highest public service award. And in that nomination form that he considered to give that award out, it includes, oh, we're facing litigation on this. We're facing critiques from groups like the Canadian Medical Association. Uh, First Nations are complaining about it. Provinces and territories don't think we're doing the right thing with Jordan's principle. But these staff members have weathered all that critique. And we have no Jordan's principle cases, so we're going to give them the award. And it was just, it was... I, I I don't even know how to describe it. What's the word for that? Like, what? how do you describe that? Like all of the harms that you just talked about and everyone can imagine, you know, a four-year-old child who is going to say after suffering from that mishap from your dental surgery and, and now you have brain damage and you and you need a bed that props you up, who on earth? Like, aside from the clearly the federal government would say no to those kinds of things and then reward the bureaucrats for that. It it sounds like something you would hear about in another country, like literally the opposite. So bizarre, so beyond Canadian values or First Nation values or just the basics of human rights. You know, like I... I was so grateful. Eventually, a doctor stepped forward in that situation and funded oh, wow. that as a private citizen for that little girl. Um, but that shouldn't be the default. We should, when we have children, I don't care who they are, uh, and they're in that kind of need, we should be there as taxpayers. Like, I want to give, give them my money. It shouldn't be by accident that you happen to have a doctor that's in a position to be able to support you in that way. It should be a vital human right that's responded to. And the fact that Government of Canada rewarded these employees with this award is just despicable. And of course, Michael Wernick, when the Trudeau government came in and they accepted all the TRC's calls to action, I was excited because child welfare and Jordan's principle are the top calls to action. And then he appointed Michael Wernick to the being privy council, for, which is the highest bureaucrat. And I'm just thinking, well, that's, he hasn't been very good on <laughs> Family services and Jordan's principle. So uh, they worried me, right? Well, no kidding. And I, I don't know. Every time I talk to you, I still feel incredulous, even though I know the data, I know the research, but you hear about all of these individual stories. And I think that's what's missing for Canadians is yeah. to know, okay, here's the situation, here's the court case, here's the stats, but here's what it means on these individual case levels uh, for this four-year-old girl or a newborn baby or a mom with three other kids or like there's, it's having real impact and it just, it, it seems beyond. So now we're in a situation where the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal has issued this compensation order. And I think, you know, as you were saying, I think it's quite notable that they weren't just compensated for the discrimination, the racial discrimination, that's clearly a harm. But for the tribunal to have looked at all the evidence and heard all the testimony and said, you know what? You knew better. You should have done better. This is willful and reckless. And, and you should you should be paid even more for the federal government's horrible breach of these human rights. That uh, in and of itself is a statement that Canada should have embraced and said, oh, wait a second. You know, we're off track here. L let's make amends. Um, but has anyone been compensated under this order yet? No, no one. And then you'll remember uh, when the order came out in September 2019, the federal election followed shortly after that. And, and uh, all of the candidates were asked about this compensation order at the tribunal. Uh, what the federal government decided to do, this was under the Trudeau government still, is they filed a judicial review and they want to quash all financial compensation. So we're actually going to go to court on that judicial review in June of this year. And uh, during the pandemic, uh, just to give you a sense of where the federal government is at, uh, 
the federal government told us that uh, included in a group that they didn't want to compensate were children who had died as a, a, in, under this period of discrimination. So people like uh, Tina Fontaine or other children who are on that resolved list. Um, we couldn't stomach that. Like the idea that they would save money because children were so disadvantaged that they died, uh, just we couldn't deal with that. So we actually had to litigate during the, <laughs> during the pandemic to make sure those children are included. But Canada is still wanting to overturn that whole decision at federal court, which would mean even those worst case scenarios we're just talking about. And I, I'm saying, I, I should tell your viewers that I'm not cherry picking, like a lot of these cases were of that gravity, right? Not all the children died, but many of them suffered uh, irreversible kind of things, like where children were denied percussion vests and have cystic fibrosis, and that really can shorten their lives over the long term. Or sometimes it was, they were denied learning opportunities, so they weren't successful in school when they could have been successful in school and graduated, like they'll never get that back. And here's the other thing I want people to understand is when the residential school thing happened, all of those children were grown up by the time it got to public parlance and they were compensating them as adults. And then with the 60s group, the same thing, they were compensating adults. In this case, Pam, as you know, a lot of these children are still children. Yeah. They're still, like we're talking about Children who, because of the non-compliance, who could be just babies or four or five years old. These are the victims of the discrimination in this group that we're talking about. And it's important for people to know that these are young children. It's starting to sound like, and you and I have had this conversation a thousand times, that Canada is a serial or repeat offender of the worst breaches of human rights when it comes to Indigenous peoples, but especially children and families. I mean, you've already mentioned residential schools and all of the multiple generation, intergenerational trauma um, and of the survivors, how they were impacted in their own families. Then you just transition immediately into 60s scoop yeah. and all the forced adoptions and the continued theft of our children. And instead of learning from all of that, now we're in what they themselves are calling a humanitarian crisis of the continued theft of children and the, and the denial of service. And I think that's important that people understand that there's yeah. multiple things going on here, that it's not just taking children from families, which is yeah. devastating and can cause you know lifelong issues, but it's also at the same time, denial of service for things that other children would receive in a provincial care system, for example, or that they desperately need because of their health condition. I mean, is, is Canada not learning by any of this? Um, well, I think that I haven't seen a lot of learning demonstrated. Um, other than I think that they're becoming better at uh, issue at, at arguing technical points and trying to get these cases dismissed on technical points. I think their arguments are becoming more sophisticated. In fact, uh, we see that a lot of the same arguments they put for the residential schools are coming forward in this compensation as well, even in their federal documents, right? Um, but what I haven't seen, Pam, and may, uh, I'd be really interested in your ideas, when I saw residential schools, and, and you and I, we've lived this, and we've met so many people who have just experienced such great harm through it. I saw the government acknowledge what they did, but I didn't get a sense of remorse. I didn't get a sense that someone sat there and thought, oh my God, we as a government, regardless of what political party they were in, because of the conservatives and, and liberals basically mm -hmm it down the middle. How did we let this happen? How did this go on for so long? What is it about the way we think and believe that we have to change to make sure this never happens again? Instead, what happened is we'll, we'll settle a class action, we'll issue an apology, and we'll move on. And then the problem with that is that they do those things, the public attention thinks it's already taken care of, and then they repeat the behavior with the 60s scoop. And even now, 
like I've looked at those documents and as I say, I just can't get those kids out of my mind. I don't see that in the government. I don't see them really sitting with the harms that were done to these children. And I, I say that they have to sit with that because they have to learn and they can't do it again. If you or I had done, let, let's just take this down to another level. If you or I had done this to one generation of kids with this, with the residential schools, and we know that children died in residential schools, four to 6,000, Canada knew about those deaths. A lawyer, Samuel Hume Blake, the founder of Blake's Law Firm, said that in the Canada fails to obviate the preventable causes of death that brings itself into unpleasant nearness with manslaughter. That was 1908. So. If we had done that, and then uh, we uh, we apologized, and then did the 60s scoop, and then we had been willful and reckless and allowed these harms and deaths to come to children, and we were before a judge, um, what do you think they would say to you and I? Right? <laughs> they would be talking to us as we're dangerous offenders. That's well, exactly. We haven't demonstrated. We're still fighting, right? And they're fighting on the, what they feel is the government's best interest. And what's so weird about that is they're supposed to be representing the public. And I've ha had the blessing of talking to thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people all over the country of all political persuasions. And no one thinks it's a good idea giving First Nations kids less because of their race in public services. Uh, well, sure, you might find a few proud boys out there that might think it's a good idea, but the average, you know, most people are good people regardless of political persuasion. And, and so I don't know who's been, who they think they're, they're acting out in benefit for. I think the Canadian public is already at a place where they're saying, this is nonsense. Why do First Nations kids not have clean water? Why are we, I mean, those are good questions. And the answer is that Canada is continuing to deliver this apartheid system and to resist the implementation of orders like this and not take accountability for its own learning. And it's not like this hasn't been brought to Canada's attention. So World Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Oh, we've got a crisis in the child welfare system. Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada in regards to residential schools. Even their recommendations are saying, oh, I think you need to address this crisis. The National Inquiry into Murder to Missing Indigenous Women and Girls finds Canada guilty of historic and ongoing genocide. And one of those mechanisms of genocide that is harming our nations is the child welfare system because of what it means. Mm -hmm. You know, once, once you're engaged in the child welfare system, then there's all these multitude of paths that you can end up on from by virtue of the harms that are suffered. Not not in all of those cases, but we're talking about, you know, your likelihood to end up in youth corrections, your likelihood to end up with mental health issues, your likelihood to be detached from your family or, you know, live precariously on the streets, you know, street living. Like there's there's so many pathways that are created by Canada and and I'd have to say maintained. Yeah. Like it's not like it's without knowledge and, 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 you know, you and I keep talking about this and I feel like, you know, when is going to be the podcast where we're celebrating yeah. and high-fiving and saying, yeah, Cindy, this is great. You know, like it's all ended and they've apologized and we've got this, this system, but they don't even have a plan to end genocide. They don't even have a plan. You know, they're still fighting residential school survivors in court. So. Yeah. And though we got the spear bear plan to end all this, right? Yes. So um, to a series of inequality and to create a Marshall plan to address them. And the good news is much of this work has already been done by the parliamentary budget officer, by First Nations experts, by economists. So it's not rocket science. We could do this very quickly. And by doing it, by the way, we would save the government all kinds of money because we all know the very best investment of any government is in children. You invest in a child, you can save all kinds of money downstream because that child goes up to be a healthy, happy human being who's less reliant on all the support services. And so that just is just a common sense kind of thing. Uh, the, so this proposal of reducing these inequalities would go a long way. And, and you know, if you're, I was actually in a Twitter kind of debate with somebody this weekend. It was interesting. 
I think I get into more of those now that I'm in, in lockdown because usually I just let it pass. Yeah, yeah. But this person was raising an interesting theme, i.e. around water. And the question was, well, why you sound like you aren't acknowledging all the good work they're doing. Um, you know, they've done something. You're saying they haven't done something. And I had to kind of go back and say, no, I'm not. I No one said they haven't done anything. But the question is, when you have people out there who have been waiting 153 years for clean water, is what they have done a, uh, enough of a defense for what they have yet to do? And when that yet to do is to simply get clean water pumping out of pumps so that kids can actually get a clean glass of water. If this was downtown Toronto and I took that point of view, it's like, look at all the stuff I've done. Sure. Or even Texas right now um, for a real life example. Like, you know, look at everything I've done for you um, and be grateful for that. Make sure you, you're grateful for that, because at some point you can have faith that I will address your water crisis. And yeah, it might have been 153 years up until now, but just trust me on that. Would that be acceptable? And it's not not, it, you know, what we're talking about is basic fundamental human rights. And I and uh, so people say, well, we'll never get it perfect. And I always say to folks, perfection is not the standard I'm holding you to or holding the government to. These are minimum standards, i.e. follow the law, follow their law, the Canadian, Canadian government's law. That's what I want. Yeah, exactly. That's the whole thing. Canada is the outlaw here. So you don't get to say, well, they're only partially being an outlaw because how many times have you said oh you know there's no such thing as incremental equality yeah. you have it or you don't you're yeah. either breaching the human right or you're not there's not well we'll just slowly deal with it over time and and like all of this leads to you know why we're here talking today yeah. which is about this new report from the parliamentary budget officer yeah. it's, it's called um compensation for the delay and denial of services to First Nations children. It was just issued uh, yesterday or the day before. And, you know, it's talking about what it's going to cost Canada to properly compensate the victims of past and ongoing, essentially, racial discrimination against First Nations children and families. Can you give us a little bit of context about this report? Because this report comes out, and I don't know that most Canadians are going to look at it and say, oh yeah, I, I get where this is coming from. Right. So this particular report is only on those persons who are discriminated because of Canada's improper application of Jordan's principle. The parliamentary budget officer actually did another report on children who are removed from care. Now, what the parliamentary budget officer did is looked at, well, who were all these kids that were harmed by Canada, by the discriminatory pieces? How many children are we talking about? And then if we multiply that number by 40,000, then how much is it gonna cost Canada to compensate these children? And um, the parliamentary budget officer offers a range. On the low end, they talk about roughly, you know, around several billion dollars. Um, that figure is based on a partial interpretation of the orders, but the tribunal actually issued an order last week or a week and a half ago it clarifies that the framework agreement, which is just a technical term, but the framework agreement that the parties agreed to about who is eligible is actually the proper group. And to compensate that group, it's $15 billion. Now that might, people might go, whoa, $15 million, that's a lot of money. And it is, but not for the individual children and families who are discriminated against. The most they will get is $40,000. And that's where it's only that big number because Canada hurt so many children and their families. And continue to do so. And continues so, to do so. Th that's part of the problem here. Had they not, not done this at all, we wouldn't be talking about compensation. Had they, uh, upon the issuance of the original decision, said, okay, we're going to stop discriminating, then the cost would be lower. But they continue to fight it. So they are exaggerating their own costs so it's it's not like the it's coming from the children it's actually canada who's just letting it add up yeah and what we've always said um we wanted to stop canada's discriminatory behavior so children didn't have to be compensated for all the harms of their childhood 
I'd rather, I mean, I, I, I asked the average citizen, what would you rather do? If I offered you $40,000, but you had to uh, have your child placed in child welfare care, or I'm going to deny your child um, the autism or education or life-saving supports that he or she needs, um, even though they're available to other kids. Would you take me up on the 40 grand? I don't think very many people would. I hope nobody would. Yeah. Um, and so like, that's what we were after. We want to stop the discrimination. I don't want to see round four of compensating First Nations children for their childhoods. That's what it, we're after here is stop the behavior Canada, right? And I think that's what Canadians really need to demand is they we've normalized this really apartheid service delivery. The unfortunate thing is we've normalized it so the Canadian society can kind of get excited about other things uh, and focus on other things. But for those children, those same kind of harms we were talking about are still happening. Exactly. And it can result in lower lifespan, health issues. I mean, I've, you, there's just so many examples of children who didn't get the health service that they need and now they have permanent or lifelong uh disabilities because they weren't treated when it could have been effective one and of the things uh, in the tribunal's decision on the non-compliance orders so this is non-compliance so this is after they're ordered to fix it and implement jordan's principle and they choose not to there's a very tragic case that gets exactly to your point pam and that involves two girls from wakapika first nation um wakapika first nation in around the uh, fall of 2016, hears about a suicide pack amongst the young girls and makes a request urgently for mental health care. That goes into the, the group that's supposed to be processing these Jordan's principal requests. Um, and it sits on their desk, they don't do anything about it. In January of that year, the following year, so that'd be 2017, so just a couple months after this original proposal, urgent proposal went in, these two 12 year old girls die of suicide. When it hits the press, the federal government then says, this proposal came at an awkward time in mm -hmm. the funding cycle. So that was the response. And then the tribunal notes, links the deaths of these two girls to Canada's non-compliance. Because had they had the mental health supports that the community was urgently requesting, we those families may not have had to bury their children, their daughters in such a tragic way, right? That's the cost of non-compliance. When you hear non-compliance, that's what it is. And, and it also brings to life what is racial discrimination? Often people misunderstand it's just you're taking offense or it's name yeah. calling and and those can be part of that. But we're talking about life. This is when the government discriminates against you. Right. And we have the Indian Act, which you and I have talked about yeah. before, which is at the epicenter of all these problems. Um, when you have a government who takes a particular group of people, in this case, First Nations folks, and says basically you're not worth the money. We're going to underfund every public service on reserve. And then we're going to ask, uh, throw a few coins your way to address some of that inequality. But your response ought to be that you're grateful for us, that things aren't as bad as they were yesterday. Instead of still being very upset that every other person in the country gets a certain level of ser support services that your children have never seen in their lifetime. Right? Uh, that That is what it is about. And I, th I think there's false equivalencies in this document or this conversation about racial discrimination. I'm talking about when the government racially discriminates against you. That's what's happening to these kids. And the very severe consequences uh, yeah. from it. And, and so, you know, I've been looking on the media, this parliamentary budget officer report came out, it's available online, the previous yeah. one is available online, basically everything is on your website, you can find if you want to. Um, and I was looking to see what would be the response to that. I, I was shocked by the low level of response uh, to this report because it is significant. It, I mean, it's talking about compensation that rightfully should belong to these um, children and families. But I also saw, you know, some 
I guess, upsetting or disturbing comments or political comments coming from uh, different people. And I'm wondering, you know, to me, you're the best person to respond to this. And, and, and you know, like I know, in the media, sometimes you get 30 seconds to respond. You get a minute. You're lucky if they ask you the right question to respond. So I'm wondering if I can just, you know, pose a couple of, of comments to you and see what the response is. Because I've seen some some of Canadian officials say previously and uh, currently to say, well, you know, it's not that we have a problem with the compensation order. We're not challenging that. We just, we need more time to figure out how to actually go about doing the compensation. I mean, is that the case? No. Um, number one is uh, we already have a process that the government was part of to develop the, the distribution of the compensation. They just need to implement it. Uh, which means writing the checks and sending them to the victims. Um, the second piece around um, we need to kind of talk to people or whatever. They've already talked to First Nations. We've had our hearing. Uh, the tribunal has ordered it. The first, There's nobody out there protesting saying, no, I don't want my citizens to get $40,000. Um, and I should say the tribunal actually says in the order, <clears throat> that amount is not enough that this is a maximum amount we can award under the law. But given the harms we've seen, we wish we could have gone higher, but we can't. That's what the law says. But those children can then pursue additional claims and class actions. So for Canada, to me, this is a yes and proposition. And what they're trying mm -hmm. to say is, no, 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 it's either or, which is basically law shopping for them, right? They want to see where they can get the best deal that saves them the most money instead of having their eye on the victims and thinking, my God, $40,000 doesn't go very far for a kid. What can we do to really try to make them whole given what we've done? Yeah, so it's really disingenuous when you hear other people say, oh, well, we have to consult First Nation leaders first. What, what First Nation leader is going to say, no, please, we don't want the compensation. And that's that's not that's an order from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. You just abide by it. It's kind of like an order from the court that says, you know, stop breaking the law. You abide by it. You don't consult and say, should we or should we just keep being outlaws? Like that's that's an improper use, I think, of consultation. Now, the other thing I've heard is, oh, Canada won't be able to afford to compensate these children. What's your response to that? Well, then they shouldn't have discriminated against them in the first place. Um, the other, the other part is that, um, you know, the, since COVID has happened, they have been spraying money everywhere. I didn't even know we had this amount of money, which shows me two things. One is it was always possible for them to remedy that discrimination, uh, during those many years when it was being raised, not only in shop offer and Jordan's principle, but in water and other areas. And they chose not to do it. The second is. Do we really want to be a part of a society where the government can pick any group of people? Tomorrow, it might be blonde haired people with green eyes who are going to get 50% less and 30 uh, of every public service and they're one in six of them are not going to get clean water. Is that what we really want to see in, in Canadian society? And then for the government to say, well, okay, we did that for you for so long, the number got so big, we can't afford to compensate you or treat you equally anymore. You know, I don't want to live in that kind of society. Oh, no kidding. Because so far, it's only us right. that is being it's said, oh, that. we can't afford you or you don't deserve it or we'll just keep doing it and increasing the costs. Yeah, because the, the other one, you know, I've heard some people say, oh, well, you know, we should be less focused on this litigation and more focused on the pandemic. But do, to my mind, wouldn't you think that the pandemic exacerbates this situation versus, oh, we can just ignore all these human rights abuses for now? Well, you know, I would just look for volunteers uh, amongst those who hold those views to see who they want me to turn their water off, um, <laughs> you know, during the pandemic and, and uh, to cut their educational funding to make sure that only 35% of them have broadband access so they can go to work or go to school um in in a virtual environment that's the live reality of first nations people so that kind of argument to me is just really symbolizes the lack of information that the canadian public has to make those kinds of, of judgments 
And that's a sad thing. Like when we talk about colonialism, we often talk about the impacts on First Nations, Métis or Inuit peoples, but there was impact on the other side too. And that was keeping people in the dark, feeding them stereotypes and allowing them to come out with what they think are very strong beliefs. Like I always find it interesting where people will challenge me because they think I know what the real answer is. <laughs> and then I'll say, Fair enough, but I'll, here's all the evidence I have why I hold my belief. The parliamentary budget officer, the auditor general, XYZ researchers. So let's see what you got on your side to support your <laughs> beliefs, right? Uh, I had one guy uh, who eventually d decided he would send me his evidence, and it was from a website called Blazing Cat Fur or something. Anyway, to his credit, he decided that probably wasn't the most credible source. But that's the thing, you know, when you're doing racial discrimination, and you often feel the strongest about things you know the least about. Well, exactly. And this is part of the reason why we do these podcasts, why we do these YouTube videos, so that people who want to know more beyond just the headlines or who are concerned can actually say, here it is, and then follow up afterwards with your website because you literally have everything on it. Now, two really important questions when whenever we end these podcasts. A, what is the right path forward? What should Canada do right now today? Comply with the orders and implement the Spirit Bear Plan to end all the inequalities. Um, that, would, that would eliminate uh, the discrimination going forward. Um, and it would make such a huge difference to families and to children. This would be the first generation, Pam that was ever treated equally by the Canadian government in the provision of public services. If we can do this, it'll be the first time in 153 years. There were, their are governments always looking for new things to do. Like the US have sent that satellite off to Mars. I'd like to see a Canadian equivalent of making sure that First Nations kids know that they can go to a good school, get a good education, be healthy and proud of who they are. I think we can do that together. So that's number one. Number two, regarding this compensation decision. Get, the, get on the phone to your member of the parliament and tell them that you want the government to drop their judicial review, their appeal of this tribe, this compensation and, and pay these kids. It's a small measure of justice. It's the minimum they should be doing. They should also be offering them mental health supports, post-majority care, things like um, you know uh, assistance with, with employment, all of these things, as much as we can do to try and restore those children to the point where they would have been had they not been discriminated against should be on the table because they didn't deserve this. They're just little kids. And some of them are still just little kids. Yeah. And, and there's just so much that can be done. And so um, for, for people who want to do more, who want to help, I mean, they can make financial donations. Um, you have multiple free ways to help, all of that's on your website. And the Spirit Bear plan, I mean, that it literally lays out what the government can do. So it's not like they don't know what to do. Um, what do you think is ultimately holding everything up? Like, what do you think it is that stops them from respecting the basic human rights of First Nations children? I think it's uh, they don't realize how the colonial DNA affects them as people and as agents of the government. I think that they they don't they they somehow think that they're above it when the system and the the architecture of the government is systemically racist against First mm -hmm. Nations. And they also don't want to own accountability. Like even in this case, I hear when I hear ministers talk about it. Oh, it's for past discrimination. Well, actually, it's, we're still litigating <laughs> against you. The tribunal is still saying you're discriminating. So I think you're still discriminating. You're the only one that's in denial. Everyone else can see it. So it's that lack of being willing to take the political leadership that's required and say, we are messing up. Not only did we mess up in the past, we we're messing up right now. And this is what we're going to do to show people that we've learned enough and we're gonna hold ourselves accountable and we're gonna welcome any accountability measures that are out there to make sure we don't backslide. That would be such a wonderful day. And I don't think the government realizes they would get far more credit from First Nations and from the public if they were honest than mm -hmm. this, this rerun show of theirs, of public relations, of we are engaging with First Nations, we're doing all, 
people know that's a bunch of BS, to be honest. And I think that honesty really pays. It's what we expect from our family members and our people in our own circle. It's what we ought to expect from the government too. And if we only took it from our own perspective, what would we want for our own children, our own grandchildren, our own nieces and nephews in our own community? And I think if you look at it from the human point, there's no doubt that if this was a massive problem in Ontario for other than Indigenous peoples, you'd probably, you'd probably be protesting in the street. But somehow kids get wiped under... Um, First Nations kids get left behind every time. And, you know, just before we end, you know, I want to say you and I have been to the United Nations and Inter-American Commission and lots of different processes before. And we go and say, here's this urgent crisis, human rights violations. And Canada responds with an, like a big long list of, oh, but we have this program yeah. and we have this initiative and we had this many meetings, but they never say, can answer the question, what have you done to actually improve the situation? Has the situation improved? Have the human rights breaches stopped? Are kids less likely to be taken away from their family? Because, because it's not. And in some cases and in some circumstances, situations are getting worse. Um, and it's across all of the socioeconomic things that you're talking about. And so, you know, I'd really like Canadians to just say, show me where you've made it better. I don't want to hear your program or your meeting or your initiative. Show me that it's better and that it's done and that it's over. And, and show me that you're not accepting any level of racial discrimination. Yes. As a child. Zero. That's the bottom line. Zero. No excuses. No, we're working on it. No, no. too complex. This is unacceptable. Any child in this country should not get less because of who that child is due to their sexual orientation, to their religion, mm -hmm. to their merit, uh, the, the family composition that they're in, to their race, to their national ethnic origin. No child should get less because of who they are. And that's exactly what's happening. And that's what we need to hold the government's feet to the fire. And do not listen to what they say. They say a lot of things. Yeah. what they do and if that thing if what they're doing is actually changing children's lives for the better i think that's the most important point to end on that this isn't degrees of racial discrimination it's a yes or no there yeah. there's no discrimination it stops now are you going to get funded same level yes are you going to get funded for what you need yes it's as simple as that and cindy i can't thank you enough for always making time to come on this podcast and on YouTube and help educate people and keep them updated on what's happening on this case as it moves along. Because as you know, with the media turnover, they might hear about an issue one time and then it's off to a different one, then it's an election and then it's a pipeline and then it's something else. And people forget or think it's been resolved because someone said, oh yeah, we're working on it. So thank you for what you and your team do to stand up for kids. Well, thank you for having me. And thank you for being part of the warrior team for kids, right? You know, the one thing, a message I wanna uh, say to all those kids is I know that you are super special. I've had the privilege and honor of seeing you. You know, you, some of you are into science. Some of you are great into the arts. Some of you are, are having fun with your families and you're bringing great joy to your communities and you're doing all kinds of great things. We see all of that for you. And that's why we really want to know and show you that we love you enough to stand up for you and make sure you've got the same opportunity so that you can give all those wonderful gifts of all the people that you are um, throughout your life. You're not alone. And we'll never stop. No, I'm not gonna stop. We'll never stop. You've got warriors here on the outside who are always gonna advocate for you um, because you're little warriors every day that you get through, that's that's a warrior who gets through that day and you know we're working. So that, that's a really positive message. And, and I also appreciate how you make it about the kids, involve the kids, and that you make this a collective effort. Yeah. You know, this is about all of us, Canadians included, making yeah. life better um, for these kids so they never have to go through this again. And thank you to all the listeners and viewers for making the time to learn more, to take that extra step, to not assume what the government says is true, not assume that the issue is over because you don't see it in the media or you don't hear any commentary about this parliamentary budget officer report. Look at it, read it, 
um, listen to these podcasts, share it widely, and put pressure on all of your members of parliament and your MPPs and anywhere where you have influence. Push, push, push to end unlawful racial discrimination that does significant damage to First Nations children and families. And share this podcast far and wide. Be the change that's required. Force governments to be accountable. Till next time, keep living a warrior life. Goodbye, everybody. Malalia.